and I'm letting people in. Hello, hello and welcome to our guests who have just arrived. We will have more of you trickling in over the next couple of minutes, but I thought I'd admit you to start with. Um, welcome to Avid Readers uh, Zoom space again for some of you. Hi, Diane, again. Lovely to see you twice in a row. Um, and yeah, tonight is, um, I normally give you a weather report and um, goodness, have I got some weather for you. Uh, I certainly was looking up um, BOM because we have um, one of our very rare small in-store events tomorrow night with um, a larger Zoom audience and um, it is going to be a storm. So the weather has started tonight and I think it's going to continue for another week. We're going to get some rain and hail. So um, I've closed my doors and windows against it. Imagine that um, if you're at Avid Reader, we'll probably be huddled inside, I think, against the cold and the wet, which is happening outside. Good reading weather. Good reading weather, absolutely. I reckon the next week you're just going to have to uh, huddle up with a book. Now, um, this book is a good one to huddle up to, actually. So do feel free to, uh, actually, that's, the next thing that I'm going to do is to tell you all about the Zoom functions. Um, and the Zoom functions include the fact that you will all be on mute during the event um, and that uh, you will be able to ask questions though. And the questions um, will be able to be put through the chat function, which I'm just about to show you where it is by putting a sneaky link to the book. So there we go. There is a sneaky link to how to win an election. Um, and also to let you guys know that um, tonight and for the next 24 hours, there is 10% off um, the book and any other books that you put in your cart. So just for, for um, Kathy, who's just arrived as well, 10% um, off anything you put in your cart for the next um, 24 hours if you use the code event uh, and that will get you that 10% off, not just the book of the moment, but any other book you choose to purchase tonight um, or for the next 24 hours on Avid Reader's web shop. Great. Well, look, I'm going to start um, the proceedings off now. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on. In this area, it's the Yagara and the Turrbal people. I'd like to pay my deepest respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to any other, uh, any other elders um, who will be here and watching this event. But also, I'd like to mention that we are going to be zooming out onto the lands of um, lots of different Aboriginal people around Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to those elders as we zoom out there. Um, this is Aboriginal land. It always was Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. Now, tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce my guests to you. Um, we have Dr. Chris Wallace, who's an associate professor at the 5050 by 2030 Foundation. Uh, Faculty of Business, Government and Law, University of Canberra. She was long listed, uh, a long standing member of the Canberra Press Gallery, where she worked for the Australian Financial Review, the Australian Channel 7 and ABC TV. Wallace is the author of several books, including uh, the biography of Jermaine Greer, um, Untamed Shrew, which is probably um, pertinent because there was a bit of a um, a, a bit of a, uh, an anniversary of um, one of Jermaine's books this week. And I can't for the life of me remember off the top of my head what it was. Um, you probably know, Chris. But anyway, that was this week. Um, you've also written The Private Don, The Man Behind the Le Legend for Don Bradman, um, and Hewson, A Portrait. And um, tonight we are, of course, talking about all things elections with how to win an election. 
In conversation with Chris, we have Dennis Atkins, and Dennis has covered Queensland politics from a national and state perspective for almost three decades. Dennis was also the national political editor of the Korea Mail from 2000 to 2005, and also the national affairs editor um, from 2007. Dennis is currently a political columnist for In Queensland and The New Daily. Dennis is also a regular guest on The Insiders and the, on the couch or on the Zoom, I think it is now, um, and has been since early 2008. And it is always a delight to see Dennis's face when I get up on a Sunday morning. So um, welcome to Dennis Atkins and I will pass over to you. Thanks, Chrissy, And uh, welcome to everyone who's uh, tuning in. Uh, this should be a, a fun night. Chris Wallace is um, one of Canberra's uh, great political uh, writers. Um, she's also a great uh, storyteller, raconteur and author. And uh, um, her book, uh, How to Win an Election, is something that is a must read for anyone involved or interested in politics. Um, here in Queensland at the moment, we've got an election going on. There are a record 597 candidates standing for the 93 electorates uh, across Queensland. Uh, so I think that uh, at least 597 people in Queensland should have got a copy of Chris's <laughs> book and, and should have been reading it uh, as, as they were um, preparing to go out and, uh, and wear out some shoe leather. Uh, look, Chris, you, you've written a book, How to Win an Election. What are, what, what are we like in Australia at winning and running elections? Are we good or are we bad? You'd have to say, Dennis, that Antipodean electoral systems are pretty good. Uh, when you tune in to the evening news and see what's going on around the world, you probably, like me, think, thank God we're in Australia. Uh, we can't say that we've got the absolute best system and set of democratic practices in the world because the New Zealanders are kind of actually as good and often uh, better. So Antipodean democracy is in pretty good shape overall. However, to, to really have the best democratic outcomes, you've got to have a strong opposition and a strong government uh, with a strong opposition holding governments accountable for their behavior and providing enough of a kind of competitive stimulus to make the government perform. And it's, it's kind of, insidiously happened in Australia that federal labor has become very bad at winning federal elections. Now, it's only when you kind of stand back and look at the, the record that you can see, and this is surprising to many people, the Liberal and National Party coalition has governed nationally now for 18 of the last 24 years. Now, except for the continuous period of, of Liberal National Party rule from the time that Menzies got elected through to the time that Gough Whitlam beat Billy McMahon in 1972, that that 23 year run of continuous LNP rule, the current period, the last quarter century is actually the second worst period for the Labor Party in terms of its federal election performance. So something's wrong. So you're saying then that uh, the Labor Party are pretty bad at uh, elections and the Liberal Party, Liberal National Coalition are pretty good at it if, if we look at that sort of, uh, you know, score, scoreboard. Um, but we often hear, and this is one of the things that always intrigues me uh, in whenever there's a post-mortem in an election, uh, we hear that Labor won the campaign but lost the election. I mean, you yeah, know, that's that's a bit of a, you know, sort of a cop out, isn't it? That's, that's sort of an excuse for why they lost. It is complete bunkum. And there's been way too much on the Labor side, uh, kind of letting it through to the keeper in terms of analysis. Um, I've got to say, Labor used to be very good at winning federal elections. You'll recall that the Hawke and Keating governments won five elections in a row and did some pretty major things on policy that, uh, that have endured almost to today, and some of them have endured until today, um, although LNP governments have done their very best to undo a lot of them. So it's not as though Labor hasn't historically known how to win, but it seems to have disconnected from its history and its understanding of how you do it. And it's fallen into this kind of terrible period where 
it lets itself off over its losses. It doesn't do the hard work to really inculcate a, a culture of excellence in terms of its own performance as a professional political operation. And it's, it's also fallen into this kind of, you know, it's my turn leadership culture. So instead of federal labor focusing on, okay, how do we really optimize our political operation across all the ways that we need to perform excellently at, in order to avoid unnecessarily losing elections, which is what happened in 2019, 2016. Instead, Labor federally has fallen into this kind of hit and hope psychology, which is yielding loss after loss after loss. And whether you support Labor or not, it's bad for democracy in Australia because good government relies on strong oppositions, providing accountability, and providing a strong competitive challenge that makes that make governments perform. You know, if voters can't go to the, the ballot box and be, con be convinced that, you know, they could change government and change Australia for the better, it's not good. And, you know, Labor's fallen into a, a hole of mediocre political performance as a political operation. Yes, and it's interesting you say that, uh, you know, there, there, there has been a bit of a, um, you know, it's my turn leadership attitude within the Labor Party. Um, you know, we, we, we have seen over the last decade, you know, uh, Labor sort of kick off this revolving door of leadership. Um, now that settled down a bit because of the rule changes that Kevin Rudd introduced. Uh, but, you know, we still have got this thing where, um, oh, everyone, you know, say after the last election, everyone expected Anthony Albanese to take over from Bill Shorten. Uh, but it struck me at the time that not many people really thought about, well, why should that be? Is he the best person for it? Now, you talk in, in your book, at the very beginning of the book, you talk about leadership, which is, of course, an excellent place to start. And you talk about the need for leaders to have both the substance and the theatre of politics uh, in, in their um, armory of, of, of skills. Um, you know, you know does, does, do you think that the Labor Party these days uh, understands that or, or, or do they think that they can get away with without having the right mix of those two things? You know, as human beings after every election, and, and it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a hardened political journalist, an ordinary voter, an actual MP, uh, most people go, oh, the election was won or lost because of this, or they might have two reasons, you know, because of this and this. But I actually, in this book, set myself the task of, of answering the question, why was it that Labor so narrowly lost in 2019 and 2016. What was it, you know, was it what people thought? Was it a leader who wasn't quite good enough? Was it this or was it that? And then I was astonished, you know, when you look at federal elections over the last half century, one third of Australian federal elections are so close that government is formed by the winner with just a handful of seats. Now, Bill Shorten, lost in 2019, but if you look across the panoply of all the things you've got to do well in order to win, so many things were done in just an FAQ or okay or not good enough kind of manner that if you'd done even only one or two or three of those things a bit better, it might have been the shortened government instead of the Morrison government in office by two seats. Equally, the previous election, Malcolm Turnbull won by one seat. Now, if Bill Shorten had done better in even a couple of really basic areas of operation, it could have been the Shorten government back then. So, you know, even carrying a leader who had his limitations in terms of being able to do the substance and the theatre of politics, you know, Bill Shorten could have easily won. Um, when you raise the, the theatre and, and, and substance of politics, of course, the 2019 election campaign was kind of heartbreaking in a way, because you know, and I know that Scott Morrison is one of the most ruthless and Machiavellian uh, conservative politicians in the post-war period, hands down. Yet he managed to construct for that five-week campaign, the daggy dad persona, 
and run it up and down the East Coast, run it across Australia, uh, energetically connect with the voters, radiate love at them, have them radiate love back. And of course, that was beamed into every lounge room every night through the evening news for five weeks. Compare and contrast Bill Shorten. He had a large suite of, of policies. Uh, you know, he thought he was a certain winner. To be fair to Bill, every single news poll between the 2016 election, which he narrow, narrowly lost, and the 2019 election, right up to and including on election day, pointed to a Labor win. But he was complacent, you know, had kind of started measuring up for the drapes. And, you know, while energetic, voter-loving Daggy Dad was running around Australia, Bill Shorten was wooden, he was within himself, he wasn't connecting with voters. You know, you'd see him in, in, in handshake lines and you'd already be looking at the next person's face before he'd finished interacting with the person he was dealing with. Uh, he was poorly art directed. He'd be in coats, suit coats were a little too big, which made him kind of look like a boy on a man's mission. You know, the theatre of it was horrendous. And Scott, you know, when you're up against someone like Scott Morrison, super cunning, he managed to dodge up a persona that no one believes in, but worked, versus Bill, who was kind of already measuring up the drapes and didn't think to perform in the way that he needed to. You know, you just go, oh my God, you know, these are professional politicians. They should know better, they should be doing better. Yes, and um, I mean, it's interesting. You say in the book, uh, when you're talking about, um, you know, the, the need to combine uh, substance and theatre, you, you actually use a quote from the theatrical world where you say that uh, action is character. Um, uh, and with... Scott Morrison, now we all know, you know, the cliche, Scotty from marketing and all that sort of stuff. But Scott Morrison does understand action. I mean, he, he's someone who, you know, to my mind, has completely understood, swallowed, digested, you know, become the uh, consultant's um, mantra of you've got to be doing things you know the the voters don't want you to talk about something they want you to do something so he is forever doing um you know is is scott morrison the ultimate action man in 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 that sense he understands that winning voters over is about emotion and people love the kind of commitment and energy he radiates he made it all about the voters, whereas Bill Shorten, somewhat wooden, you know, kind of within himself, it seemed to be it was about Bill Shorten. You know, he was talking at voters instead of with them. And I, I think, you know, again, to be fair to, to federal Labor, uh, there's a pattern amongst social democratic parties around the world that they don't get that politics is about emotion. They think if you do a good analysis and you come up with a reasoned position and you come up with brainy policy, but it's kind of self-evident people should just know to vote for you. Whereas the other side, the conservatives understand that it's emotion. You know, they don't bother with facts or great policy or whatever. Uh, they, they're going for the emotion and they're winning election after election, uh, not on their merits, but because of, of their superior political craft. Meanwhile, on the social democratic side, you know, this lesson isn't, isn't being learned. Um, I actually quote David Runciman, the uh, Cambridge academic at one point in the book who, who has the very interesting insight that, you know, most people when they look at a, a, a potential political leader that they might vote, vote for go, you know, do I like them? But then the even more important question that determines where they put their vote is, would they like me? Mm -hmm. So you had Morrison performing the Daggy Dad. It was all about the voters for Morrison. He radiated love at them, they reflected love back. Whereas Bill, it was all kind of inward focus. It was hopeless theatre. And, you know, it really cost him. However, you know, the tragedy is um, Bill Shorten can be a tremendously engaging and magnetic kind of character. And in fact, um, one of the anecdotes in the book concerns uh, Shorten going to talk to a group of students at an Australian university, not during the campaign, but, you know, in the run up to it. And it was, a, it was you know, a pretty tough meeting, lots of tough questions and, the vice chancellor went and he heard Shorten give rote wooden answer after wooden answer, you know, going on and on. 
And then one student asked a particularly hard question about immigration. And Shorten gave this phenomenal response. He just lit up the room. The vice chancellor who told me the story said he was electrifyingly good. And after it ended, the vice chancellor went up to Bill and said, Mr. Shorten, you know, I couldn't help noticing that one answer. It was just spectacular. You had everyone in the palm of your hand. Why aren't you like that all the time? And Shorten told him, my office don't think it's leader-like. They won't let me do it. Mm. So it's not as though Bill didn't have it in him to be the electrifying magnetic leader, you know, at least to the extent that Morrison was, but he didn't do it. And, you know, it, it's just not about Bill and Labor. Australia has so many deep policy challenges it's got to rise to in, in terms of climate change, inequality, employment. Um, you know, it really matters that Labor keeps fluffing elections. It really does. It's not good for Australia. Yes. And, um, you know, we, you, you, you talk about um, uh, in the book that so much of politics is about winners and losers, about, um, you know, trying to convince enough people that your policies and your approach to governing is going to make the bigger group in society better off. Um, I was struck by this, you know, when I, when I was reading it, uh, it was just before the federal budget and, uh, and then the federal budget came along and Anthony Albanese gave what I thought was a very good response to the federal budget. Mm -hmm. um, and he identified uh, one of the missing bits of the budget, which was to look after working women. And so he rolled out the childcare policy, which creates a whole lot of winners. However, we've seen in the last week, few weeks um, Scott Morrison be able to turn that policy around and say, yes, but you're going to create many more losers by taking away their tax cuts. Uh, and Labor just seems to be floundering on that. I mean, why can't they win a debate that is as basic as that? That's a really tough question. You and I both know, having, having watched opposition close up in Canberra, uh, it's a hellscape. You know, you've got no currency with the journos. It's very hard to get cut through. Uh, the government has all the power. They've got the currency of information. They can put journos on the drip and get favourable coverage and so forth. It's a tremendously hard thing to do to, to really cut through as an opposition. And, yeah, all, all credit to Anthony Albanese for a terrific budget supply reply speech. I think many people were surprised just how good it was, just how much good quality policy was in it. And you're quite right, Labor is targeting in its reply working women. How do you get the message through against the overwhelming onslaught of the power of government in information terms? Well, you know, you've got to do all the things that I've laid out in this book really, really well, starting with doing the theatre as well as the substance of policy well, so that your message can get through. Because if you're not engaging emotionally with voters, they're not going to hear your message. You've got to have fantastic people around you who can bring votes along with them. And I think probably Anthony, Anthony Albanese compared to Bill Shorten uh, has got, a, he's got an easier job in that he's got a very, very good treasury spokesperson in Jim Chalmers, who's doing a really wonderful job compared to Bill Shorten's shadow treasurer, Chris Bowen. Um, there are so many things that, that need to be done really, really well to get the message through. And it's it's just 10 times harder from, from, from opposition. So what Anthony Albanese should do is one thing. Um, what Bill Shorten didn't do was, you know, perform in a way that engaged voters, have effective people around him, focus on the polling that needed to be focused on, the primary vote, not the two party preferred, uh, fix the, the steaming messes uh, in terms of uh, polarised positions within the Labor Party on the environment versus mining. You know, just hoping that would go away, straddling, straddling the barbed wire fence, doing social media so much better. There were so many things Shorten could have done and didn't that, that Albanese is to an extent doing better. But I've got to say, given the whole of the 10 areas I cover in the book, 
Uh, I'm not exactly sensing a fevered kind of, you know, hive of activity in lifting Labor's overall professionalism in terms of its execution of its political craft. And the thing I look at is the primary vote, which is still cellar dwelling. You know, it's still around 33, 34% for federal Labor. Historically, Labor has never won uh, an election with less than about 38.5% primary vote. Now, you know, the next federal election is probably around a year away. Uh, the Prime Minister has declared this week that he's going to go full term, probably the greatest mislead in, in politics you'll hear this year. Uh, everybody in Canberra thinks the economy is going to be dire in 2022. So very likely the election will be next year. Yet I'm not, you know, I'm sensing some improvement, but not the desperate kind of fevered, comprehensive improvement professionalism compared to last time around that there should be if Labor's going to get its primary vote up to an, to an election winning level. Yes, well, just to pick up on, on that point and uh, the other thing you talked about, which is Labor's problem of um, uh, working out its policy mix between the environment and development, in particular resource development. Um, and you go into, uh, in the book at, at some length, uh, and very well, the, the problem that Labor had at the 2019 election here in Queensland, um, where the Adani mine, huge mine in the Galilee Basin, uh, became a flashpoint for both sides. Um, we had the Bob Brown convoy, and then we had Matt Canavan and, and his uh, group Matt Canavan uh, from the National Party and his group in central Queensland. And, you know, they, practising the old divide and rule, you know, they, they said, OK, well, Labor doesn't care about workers. And all of those regional seats out of southeast Queensland went to the LNP with the exception of Bob Catter's seat. Um, so, you know, can you explain... Uh, uh, a, a bit more why these why you think these problems arise for Labor and is there a way uh, that Labor can overcome them? I know you you, you go into that in the book. Um, just take us through some of that. So, you know, you, this is an avid reader event. You're all in Queensland. You know, you are so important. Queensland is so important as a state uh, because of, because in so many ways you're kind of uh, you're the past, but you're the future. And the, the split within the Labor Party between people who are fiercely committed to the continuation and expansion of resources industries, which traditionally provide jobs in, in rural and regional areas, especially in Queensland and Western Australia on the one hand, and environmentalists on the other, who really want much faster and deeper action on climate change, is a, is a, a really entrenched thing. And you can see that in the way uh, Joel Fitzgibbon, member for Hunter, versus Mark Butler, Labor's you know, spokesperson on these kind of issues, kind of duke it out in public in a very unattractive way. Now, if you stand back for a minute and you look at the other parties, this is what you see. You see the Liberal and National Party Coalition, who, if they could have their way, would turn the whole of Australia into an open-cut coal mine. On the other side, you've got the Greens who would shut every mine tomorrow. Now, both are deeply unrealistic and unattractive, unattractive propositions. In the middle, you've got the Labor Party, which has both of these positions within them. And in the book, I argue that this is uniquely Labor's problem to solve. Because unless it solves this problem internally, it's going to be unelectable. I cast back to problems of a similar kind and dimension that were dealt with in the Hawke government. You know, really cataclysmically serious political and economic restructuring problems like the steel industry, the textile clothing and foot footwear industry. Now, back then, the Hawke government, as a matter of routine, would get everyone around the table, everyone would get everything off their chest, and together, Labor's front bench would craft a comprehensive policy package that Dennis satisfied no one, but which by the end of the process 
which has to start off with a lot of jaw boning and a lot of getting emotion off the chest, would lead to a position where everyone would sign up to a comprehensive policy package that no one thought was perfect, but everyone agreed was broadly fair, that took care of the workers' concern, transiting them to a different kind of future and compensating them and their families mightily in the process. Now, it's not brain surgery. You know, like I said, Hawke government did it several times over in really tricky areas. It can be done again, but it can't be done by leaders sitting in Canberra, not going out to places like Queensland, digging in, getting everyone together, spending the agonising weeks jawboning, developing the, pro the policy that needs to be full-blooded in its environmental commitments and full-blooded in the way it creates a future for people who won't be able to look for jobs in the resource sector, you know? Big job package wedded to big environmental action, you know, not brain surgery. But I'm not seeing it happen. I'm, I'm seeing, you know, that kind of fence straddling role that Bill Shorten had, you know, which leads to terrible grazes, Dennis. You know, that, that pain Bill Shorten was feeling as he straddled that barbed wire fence should have been a clue to actually develop a better position. And I'm not seeing Albanese do it either. And until Labor solves that, how on earth is it going to win enough seats in Queensland? to form federal government. Yes, because you, you point out in the book that, that you know, Labor needs to win, you know, well, certainly many more than the just over a quarter uh, that it currently holds in Queensland seats uh, for it to ha even have a chance of forming government. Um, it's, it's, you know, interesting that the LNP in Queensland at the moment is trying to replay the Adani argument in central Queensland. Um, and I, I've spoken in, in the last couple of weeks to politicians from both the Labor Party and the LNP who have been traveling a fair bit between Rockhampton and, and Townsville. And they say that the argument isn't quite working this time. Now, I think some of that is because we live in a very different environment with the virus and with COVID uh, dominating everything. Um, but I'm just wondering whether whether or not you know the the lack of the environment, the environmental movement, uh, and, and in the federal election we had that led by Bob Brown. Uh, the lack of that playing a really vigorous role in the debate up here has perhaps given Labor a bit of breathing space. Um, should Labor be worried so much about the Greens? You know, they, they, a lot of this seems to stem from the fact that Labor is terrified of losing its inner city metropolitan seats to the Greens uh, and overcompensates for that without doing the policy work. That, that might you know, allow it to straddle that divide? Well, in, instead of kind of crossing their fingers and hoping it all goes away, Labor needs to work out that to form government, it's got to keep hold of its inner city seats and win back regional and rural seats, right? It can do it with a comprehensive package, but it won't do it without doing the work. The other thing that needs to happen is that Labor needs to develop much better relations with the Greens behind the scenes. Now, I tell you this, if next federal election, there's another Adani convoy, convoy that comes up from the South and drives into Queensland, at that minute, the election again will be over because it doesn't hurt the Greens, it hurts Labor. So, you know, if there's gonna be an Adani convoy that set, settles into a laneway music festival in Melbourne and gets its steam off its chest, great. And that's the only, that can only be achieved if there's better internal relations behind the scenes between Labor and the Greens, a deal for constructive, not destructive competition. The Greens on their part have got to work out if they keep doing things like the Adani convoy in 2019, they will continually deliver federal government to the, to the LNP. Right now, Labor is the only alternative to the LNP. 
So the Greens have to wise up and, and get strategic and constructively compete, not destructively compete. Otherwise, the LNP project of, you know, and I know I'm hardening up the first power, I'm not being literal here, the LNP project of turning the entire Australian continent into an open cut coal mine will be achieved. Now, you know, Labor's got to do the internal work, it's got to do the behind the scenes diplomacy with the Greens on the quiet outside. And it's got to work out, it's got to work and walk and chew gum in terms of keeping hold of those inner city seats full of environmentalists and winning back the regions. It was done in the past, Port Keating government won five elections in a row, it can be done in the future, but it won't be done until Labor's much better across the board at basic political craft and stops unnecessarily losing elections. Yes. Now, you, you and I are both sort of uh, you know, battle-scarred veterans of the Canberra Press Gallery. Um, and, show me, show me know, scars. Yes. And all of us battle-scarred veterans, we all like to think it was better back in the days when we were there at the coalface. But, you know, you, you, you've got to, I think, any objective view of political reporting these days and the way politics is covered in the mainstream media would come to the conclusion that Australia is not greatly served by the media in, a, in, its, in its politics. And you make an interesting point, which uh, sort of um, had me nodding, and where you say that uh, the sports media is better at covering sport than the political media is at covering politics. Um, can you expand on that and sort of give a bit of a reflection on just, you know, are voters being let down, not just by their politicians, but also by the media who report those politicians? It is really noticeable how far Australian political journalism has declined. And it's, look, it's, it's basically not the fault of the journalists. It's the result of excessive concentration of media ownership poor media regulation, and I've got to say a lack of a failure of imagination of people like Labor and Labor's friends in really working out how to take advantage of and use properly the new digital media environment. There's so much scope to do stuff there and kind of not enough people are thinking to actually get off their butts and do it. Um, it's very hard to be in the press gallery now. There are far fewer journalists back in our day, of course, you know, you'd have a bureau with rounds people who covered specific portfolios in detail and became deeply knowledgeable and worked up a range of contacts so that they could really assess policy. Now it's a very thin line of, of journalists who are having to work around the clock without proper support, uh, doing too much too fast with, with too little knowledge base and time to develop their ideas. Um, look, it's a smoking ruin, but it's also a product of 18 of the last 24 years federally having an LNP government because the governments that have, have been in office for most of that time have not really been about great policy. They've been about maintaining power. So they've kind of trained journalists into very low standards of reporting, uh, pretty much who's up, who's down, you know, who's doing over who for the leadership. Whereas if you, if you look back to that Hawke Keating period, you know, the, the government really engaged the press gallery in a massive education project where every press gallery journalist in effect got a kind of quasi economics degree. Uh, so busy was the government trying to educate journalists about policy and they wrote about policy and it was, you know, they actually influenced policy for the better at times. It was, you know, really incredible that happened before, it can happen again. Uh, it can't happen without a few things changing. And I'm very interested in Kevin Rudd's uh, anti-Murdoch crusade at the minute. I don't know if you signed the petition, Dennis, um, but of course it's got, what, a third of a million signatures already uh, with Kevin Rudd pushing for a Royal Commission into the Murdoch media and its operations here. And, you know, this is actually a matter of world significance you know, without Fox News, there wouldn't have been a Trump presidency. And Fox News is the total creature of Rupert Murdoch. It's, you know, it's creator. So, you know, these are, these are really weighty issues. But 
you know, Dennis, it'd be great if people were strategic. You know, if you really wanted to change news corporation in order to improve Australian journalism, you'd get the institutional funds together and get them to vote to change the news limited voting structure to take away the gerrymander that gives the Murdochs the control of those media outlets. So, yeah, it's uh, it's hard times for the media. There's a lot of scope for better, better reporting. And it does frustrate me as an AFL fan, uh, as I turn into, ironically, Fox footy, uh, also a Murdoch owned operation, which does fantastic reporting on the AFL every week. Uh, you know, you can count on a kind of position by position analysis as team matchups are considered, uh, really detailed statistical analyses of what's going on. Do you ever get the same in federal political reporting? You know, do you ever see on insiders, for example, uh, a, a detailed discussion about how the shadow industry minister is going up against the industry minister and what the policy differences are and what it, me what it means? No, you know. So if I were a media entrepreneur, I'd take the Fox footy format, I'd translate it to politics, and you could really do some interesting things. You know, we should do that, Dennis. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we are, maybe we will. I mean, you know, the, you mentioned um, uh, early on in that, in that answer about social media, and, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, being a new opportunity. And you, you say in the book that, the, that social media is the great unrealized upside of Australian politics and it's waiting to be used for good. Mm. Now, um, uh, I'm not sure everyone who, who looks at Twitter might, might, might always agree with that, but you know, what do you mean by that? And what, what are political parties not doing with social media and what are the opportunities that you talk about there? that political parties uh, can get out of social media? Well, apart from the existence of Fox News being one of the crucial struts under Trump's presidency, Twitter is the other. You know, this is the guy who said eight years ago, Twitter is like owning a newspaper but without the overheads. And it's true. Um, social media is phenomenally important in direct connection with voters. Now, Labor's own policy review after the election said that Labor's dial was wiped by the coalition in terms of its social media operation. Now, it's a very difficult issue because, because politicians are mostly older. They think social media is about doing a good Instagram post or a good tweet. They don't get that successful political parties now are digital first in their campaigning. The Conservatives do understand that. Uh, the Conservatives are also doing some not very nice things uh, in terms of uh, Cambridge Analytica, that kind of manoeuvre that we needn't go into in any detail now, but um, yeah, some of it's not good, but you can be ethical and still be way more effective in your social media operation in reaching voters directly in a way you just can't otherwise reach them. And if you look back to the 2016 Labor's digital operation was actually considered better than the coalitions. Mm. Again, much like the overall campaign, there was this terrible sense of complacency. They didn't notice that in the intervening three years, the world had massively moved on in terms of digital and they lost decisively. And Labor's analysis post-election was actually really good. They said Labor didn't have the staff. It didn't have the politicians who understood it. It wasn't digital first. But again, you know, from the outside looking in, I'm not seeing a big lift in Labor's social media operation. What I'm seeing is uh, a big caveat here. I think Anthony Albanese has done a lot better in the last few weeks. Uh, but for the couple of months running up to that, what I was seeing a lot of was elbow posts holding a cavoodle on Instagram. Now, that is not a social media strategy. So, again, you know, a lot has happened in the last couple of weeks, which uh, provides hope for people who want Labor to do better. I think Albanese's budget reply was excellent. Jim, Car Jim Chalmers' press club budget speech was excellent. I think um, Richard Miles and Tanya Plibersek 
have been doing very well in Parliament in terms of holding the government accountable on uh, some recent dodgy doings. Klebersek's been fantastic on education. Chris Bowen, way better on health and, than uh, he ever was in Shadow Treasury. But, you know, across the range, that you kind of the 10 things Labor needs to be doing much better, I'm not sensing the burning lift in the standard of basic political craft necessary for them to avoid drifting into another loss. And that's not good. Yes, well, um, it, in the Queensland election, which uh, at the moment, you know, you mentioned uh, Labor's not Labor not having caught up with the coalition uh, and the conservative side of politics uh, on social media. Um, you know, this past weekend uh, was the last few days before pre-poll voting opened in Queensland um, on Monday of this week. I'm told that uh, in in the way these that these things are scored. The, the combined conservative side of politics, so the LNP, Clive Palmer, mm. One Nation and so on, outdid Labor two to one across social media platforms. Um, so, you know, sort of whatever they, they weren't doing, they're still not doing, um, which, which doesn't bode all that well. Um, if... If you sat down with the Labor Party or and were asked, okay, what should we do that we're not doing? What would be the top of your list? It'd be working out the strategies and meeting and beating them that the LNP and conservative parties around the world are using. Now, you know, Facebook, if you can't win on Facebook, it's very hard to win an election, you know, Facebook is so pervasive. Now, one third of the world's population logs onto Facebook at least once a month. Um, Twitter is, you know, we're fascinated by Twitter because we're part of that kind of Twitterati, but Facebook is way bigger. And again and again and again, you see conservative politicians take Craig Kelly and the seat of Hughes. They're all over it all the time, assembling vast numbers of supporters with whom they engage with, you know, they're tilling the soil constantly. Uh, in 2019, the meme operation that Morrison's, you know, political operation uh, created was phenomenally effective. It's like a tsunami of images, video, and slick lines uh, coming at Labor that it it barely seemed to be aware was happening. And I'm I'm interested to to hear that comment from you. It it fits with my own perception that that nothing much has changed. You know, digital is the number one political battle space now. If you're not thinking digital first, if you haven't got the staff, if your senior politicians don't understand that digital first is everything now, you know, you just, it's like trying to win an AFL grand final without a ruck. It's just not going to happen. Mm. Yes. Now, we, we, of course, you know, we're, we're in this crazy year of, 2020, um, which has been sort of disrupted like no other. And we, we have had a number of elections. We've had two territorial elections. We've had a national by-election in the seat of Eden Monaro. And at the moment, we've got the Queensland state election. Um, how is, do you think that the year of the pandemic, how has that changed the demands on politicians and political parties um, and you know, are there opportunities that, that, that this presents and are there difficulties that uh, are thrown across their path as well? The ACT election and the re-election of the Ardern government in New Zealand, plus the current federal polling in Canberra, which has Scott Morrison well ahead and the coalition well ahead of Labor, all point to, you know, a pretty common understanding in politics that in crises, people stick with incumbents. Uh, if you think back to 2001, uh, the, the election that, um, that John Howard won against the backdrop of the September 11 attacks, and then he doubled down on, on that theme with the Tampa crisis uh, of his creation. Uh, 
that's a kind of a well-established principle of politics in crises, people support incumbents. However, the US election uh, is unlikely to see the incumbent returned. You know, never say never. We'll all remember what happened last time around. But I think it will be surprising if the incumbent Donald Trump is re-elected because incumbency isn't enough. You've got to be an incumbent that actually can portray a sense of competence that make people want to stick with you. So, you know, I, I kind of worry that, you know, the, the sense of drift in Labor might turn into a sense of defeatism about whether it's even possible to win next time around that could feed into a kind of defeatism about fixing up its performance in this across these 10 areas that it needs to do way better, better at in order to avoid unnecessary, unnecessary losses. Um, I think if Labor gets into that psychology of drifting toward another loss and thinking, okay, you know, we can't win this time around, but we will next time, uh, that it'll just be another, you know, few Ks clicking down the road to lost opportunity as inequalities grow, the climate, you know, goes down the gurgler. Um, specifically in relation to the, to the pandemic, analysts are referring to the great regression for women that the pandemic represents uh, with massive disadvantages in the workforce that we thought we'd kind of got beyond are being massively uh, re-established, not least through conscious Morrison government policy, specifically favouring men over women. You know, let's not forget the ideological character of this Prime Minister. Um, you know, there's more than a Gilead tongue touch to this guy. Uh, so I think in terms of opportunity, women voters are, are a very big target. I think uh, Labor and its budget reply did the right thing in both policy and pol political terms in, in targeting women voters with a very strong childcare offering. But you know, it, it also offered a number of other really good policies of, of broad uh, interest to the economy that just didn't cut through and you wouldn't know about. So yes, incumbents usually win, incompetent incumbents don't. And Dennis, you and I know, because we've seen it more than once, every election is there for the winning. Now the entire LNP had given up on the 2019 election Senior cabinet ministers retired from politics. Julie Bishop, Chris Pine, Kelly Dwyer, on and on it went. They thought they were gone for all money. Josh Frydenberg thought right up until election day, the Libs were gonna lose. One person, Scott Morrison, thought I can win this election and he went out there and won it. You and I saw that in 1993 when John Hewson lost the unlosable election to Paul Keating, who did not accept that that was an unwinnable election. So whether you're a Labor supporter or not, everybody ought to want the Labor Party federally to be going at it bald headed to try and win that next election. And I'm just not feeling that's the vibe. Mm. Yes, yeah, it, it, it certainly doesn't feel like it. Um, I thought we might just touch on uh, you know, one thing that uh, is similar from the last federal election, 2019 federal election and the current election in Queensland, and that is the presence of the great disruptor, Clive Palmer. And you, 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 you talk about him in your book and, and you talk about uh, the fact that um, the ANU's election study uh, had a look at his impact and, and that he, he did have a real impact. He was able to, uh, with his shifty shorten advertisements, um, really damage the Labor Party uh, and the Labor leader. And of course, then Scott Morrison and, and, and the coalition sort of reap the rewards from that. Now he's back on the stage with TV ads, media ads, and a huge social media presence uh, screaming that Labor in Queensland, the Palaszczuk government, is going to introduce a 20% death tax to pay for all of its promises. Um, you know, it, it's complicated by the fact that he had such a 
you know, open the borders policy, which is very unpopular in Queensland. Uh, but what do left of centre political parties do about a right wing marauding, cashed up disruptor like Clive Palmer? Well, Clive Palmer is a major challenge to Australian democracy and being able to throw that much money at one election, what was it, 80 plus million in the federal election last year, uh, absolutely outrageous and undemocratic. Dennis, it was already a problem in 2016 and it wasn't Clive Palmer. Why Labor did not go to town on the fact that Malcolm Turnbull in the last fortnight of the 2016 election, with the donation of $1.75 million of his own money, essentially bought his own win with the extra advertising power that that donation created. You know, campaign finance in Australia is a steaming wreck, massively crying out for fundamental reform. These are anti-democratic uh, moves that have resulted undoubtedly in contributing majorly to two losses for Labor that wouldn't have happened otherwise. That said, can you remember a single ad from the Labor Party from the 2019 election? No, you can't. They were that boring. So you can remember Shifty Shorten from Clive Palmer. You can remember the bill you can't afford from the LNP. But Labor's advertising, I mean, what even was it? The one thing a political party's got total control over is its political advertising. Make great cut through ads, make brilliant mm. ads. And if they're boring or not memorable, don't pay for them, don't run them, it's pointless. So, you know, you look at the Democrats in the US, they've raised tons of money. Uh, they're making much better ads. They're beginning to twig that emotion moves voters, not reason. And partly they've been shown these skills by people like the Lincoln Project, who are Republicans, yeah, I see Ruby nodding there, and Diane too, uh, you know, Republicans who totally understand that you move voters through emotion uh, and have really been showing the way, making their own anti-Trump ads uh, to tremendous effect. I've got to add, I'm not arguing for empty politics that's only about emotion. I'm arguing about arguing for social democratic parties creating good reasoned, powerfully, you know, constructive policy and then welding emotion to that to persuade voters to their camp. Uh, you know, let's let's hope they tweak soon. Yes, well, they can do uh, you know a lot worse and you know pick up a copy of this uh, and read it and um, tell their friends to buy a copy and read it, and particularly tell uh, people who are involved in politics to buy a copy and read it because uh, it's a you know uh, as. Uh, Laurie Oakes says, um, you know, 10 commandments for politicians. Are you listening, Labor, uh, who have forgotten the basics? And that seems to be the message out of the book, that politicians have forgotten the basics. Um, I don't think Scott Morrison has. I think Scott Morrison has a tremendous understanding of the basics. Um, and that's why, you know, he's in such a commanding position in Australian politics at the moment. But you know, no one is unassailable. Yeah. Um, so um, it's been great tonight talking with you, Chris. And, uh, you know, keep writing and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Chrissy. And thanks all for coming. Um, you Thank know, you. we've really got to change Labor's performance for the better. Uh, so spread the word. There are actually a lot of people inside the Labor Party reading it. Um, I think there's a hesitation to have public discussions about some of the points like uh, ending the turn-taking leadership approach. But, you know, unless we spread the word, lift the basic political craft needed to avoid unnecessary losses, they're gonna keep coming. Fantastic. Labor's gotta learn again how to win an election. This has been uh, an absolutely fascinating conversation. We've had quite a few um, political um, uh, conversations on our events program. 
lately. And, and, and I really feel like this has been one that's just cut through and has um, really um, hit some points that we haven't heard before and that we really need to hear. Um, one, one thing I reckon is that they should possibly hire ex-avid social media person Chris Curry to do their social media because he would totally win the election. Um, he fought the trolls over, um, you know, for the feminists and um, I reckon he could certainly fight through. Um, we have one question um, from the audience and I just thought I'd quickly ask that before we finish tonight. Um, and that is from Ruby. Do you think that Albanese is capable of um, doing the theatre of politics? It's a really good question, Ruby, and I'm not gonna answer it. And I'll tell you why. If we make these discussions particular to individuals, the lessons aren't gonna be learned. Mm -hmm. so, so in the book, one of the unusual things I do is I start each chapter by putting myself in the mind of the failed leader. Yeah, and as, they, as you go through the book, by the end, the failed leader's gone, oh my God, if, I, if I'd just done this, this is, no, even a bit better, I would have won. And then they go to, to, to tell the incoming leader these, share these lessons. And of course, the incoming leader thinks they're uniquely clever, brilliant, and just going to you know, bolt it in and they're deaf to the lessons. Uh, so if I, if I give an analysis of Albo one way or another, it makes it about Albo. But really, the, the main point is leaders have to be able to do the substance and the theatre of politics both effectively and cut through and connect with voters. Mm. And, and Labor's got to ask itself, have we got the right person in the leadership, the very best person to lead Labor to a victory for the people who desperately need them to act on the big issues of inequality, climate change and employment? You know, if it's not the best leader, if it's not the person most likely to win, why are they there? Now, you never hear that. The, the lessons from the Rudd, Gillard Rudd period have been overlearned. And it's, it's one of those highly sensitive discussions that needs to happen. Um, but I'll, I'll pass on the specifics. Forgive me. What, what's oh, your but, view, Ruby? That is a project of radical empathy that you're doing in your book there, which is um, <laughs> allowing, allowing yourself into the mind of, of everyone, regardless of who they are or what their background is. So um, thank you for bringing that to us. I, I highly approve of radical empathy. I think there should be more of it. Um, so thank you, Dennis, and thank you, Chris, for tonight's conversation. And yes, again, I do um, implore people to um, have a look at this book um, if you're in the shop. Um, or if you're, you can't get into the shop, do um, feel free to pop it in your cart, um, use the code event and get 10% off that and anything else that's in your cart as well. And um, hopefully we can learn the lessons and um, we can fix a system that has been letting people down for a bit of a time now. So thank you very much for bringing this to us and um, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Yeah.